Before I get into today's film study, I just figured to let you guys know that today's episode is sponsored by SeatGeek. Of course, you guys already know what SeatGeek is. It's the best way to get tickets to sporting events, to concerts, or to any other events in your area. But if you've never used SeatGeek before, you can get $20 off by using my promo code JKS on your first purchase. Use the promo code JKS, and it'll be $20 off of your first purchase. Especially with baseball season coming up, I know my Tampa Bay Rays are in a tight race with the New York Yankees to try to win that division lead. There's a lot of interesting baseball going on right now. So that's definitely one way you could use it. And also, preseason is right around the corner, and the NFL season is right around the corner. All of those things you can use SeatGeek for, and also every time someone uses the code, it helps me out. So if it's something you're interested in, you can just click on the link in the description below and start browsing on SeatGeek. And all you have to do is enter promo code JKS, you'll save $20. And anyways, back to your regularly scheduled video. So going into the next NFL draft, knowing that they had recently given up Frank Clark, defensive end was probably a priority for Seattle. I mean, they always do seem to have a good defense, but you know, you can always use some good defensive lineman and defensive end was definitely something they could look to improve at. And so they decided to spend their 29th overall pick on LJ Collier, who's a very talented player, and let's just jump into what I like about him. Like, let's just start things off with one of my favorite plays from this one, where that's where he is going to be on the screen. It's a pivotal situation, it's a third down and one, as of right here, it would be a 57-yard field goal, so that would be a very long field goal. Most teams would probably not try it, so basically they gotta get a stop right here. It would be huge if they could get a stop. What West Virginia is going to do is have their halfback run right over there, and they'll also have a fullback lead blocking for him. So you'd think Collier would not be able to impact this play too much, since it is going to be run straight up the middle, and there is going to be a fullback over there, so there's not really much he should be able to do. The one thing he's going to do is basically just try to take out the fullback. That's going to be his idea on this one. He's going to just run over and take out the fullback. But notice how this works. Not only is he strong enough to knock the fullback into the halfback, but then he comes back, grabs a hold of the halfback, and makes a tackle, and they didn't get the first down on this play. I mean, that's a highlight real run stop if I've ever seen one. I mean, that's just an incredible play. To first have the strength to knock that fullback backwards. And keep in mind, the fullback was not trying to block LJ on that one. He was trying to just run straight forward and try to lead block and create a gap for the halfback to run through. But number 91 was able to take the fullback out of the play and make the tackle. Just a tremendous play from Coyier. There was also this next play, which is going to be another example of West Virginia not really paying as much of attention that they should have to him. And once again, it is going to come back to bite them because that's where he is on the screen. And what they're going to do is actually pull the tight end over to the bottom half of the screen. And it'll also be a play action, and that's probably the main way they're going to be trying to get number 91 out of this play is with the play action. Because then he'll cut over to the middle of the screen, and then the tight end will have enough time to break over to the bottom half of the screen. He'll be able to get in good positioning, and then Coolier wouldn't be able to finish this play. That's the way it's supposed to work. And as you see, 91 is doing a pretty solid job of, you know, stepping up, getting closer to the middle, but also being in a position where he could try to run around if possible. He's kind of preparing for a run, because that's what he has to prepare for, since it looks like it very well could be a run. But notice how the second he realizes it isn't going to be a run, he quickly just steps over to the right side of the screen. At this point, really what you'd want to do if you are the tight end and a halfback at this point, is try to push him behind your quarterback. That would be ideal. You're already not going to be able to block him straight up the way you thought you were going to at the start of this play, but that's okay. If you can still block him behind Greer, it can still be an okay play. But they're not going to have the strength to move over a big guy like that, and Coyier is able to get over there and disrupt that play. It was good strength and also good awareness. Those were the two things that were really key there by LJ. However, this guy is not just all positive. I do have some negatives with him, and here's going to be one of those negatives. That's where he is on the screen, and he's going to be unblocked here, because, you know, it is going to be actually an RPO here, where essentially it could be the halfback running into the middle of the screen, or it could be the quarterback taking it himself and running to the bottom half of the screen. Although I actually think this is actually not an RPO, I think this was actually a design run all the way, but the quarterback is just going to fake as though maybe he could be running the ball, and the reason I think that way is because look at how far into the middle of the screen Coolier is going to run. He's totally trying to stop the run here, and if the quarterback did keep it himself and run to the bottom half of the screen, I think he very easily could have ran around him. So okay, you know, he did run a little bit too far to the inside. It happens, and for all we know, maybe he figured out a tell beforehand that maybe this was going to be a run. I mean, I wouldn't go as far as say that's likely, but I would go as far as say that's possible. It's certainly possible. However, if you're going to do that, you have to make the tackle, and he does not make the tackle there, and that is one flaw I have noticed in his game. This plays another example where it's going to essentially be the same thing. That's where he is on the screen. He's the edge rusher on the bottom half of the screen. However, the slight difference this time is that he is actually not the contain man on this one. Since it is a goal line situation, all the safeties and all defensive backs are a lot closer to the middle of the screen than they would be on a typical play. So unlike that last time where he had to be in charge of making sure that he didn't give up containment, this time he is not the contain man. He can run as far in as he feels necessary to make sure he can make a tackle. And he is going to run very far in. He's actually going to initiate contact with that offensive lineman right over there, which is actually a pretty decent idea because now he can get off this block if he needs to. And he will actually need to as it is going to be a quarterback run instead of a handoff to the middle of the screen. So you know, as of this point, 
point, 91 is doing everything perfectly here. He's doing exactly what he should be doing. And he is going to get off his block quickly. However, once again, he isn't quite able to make that tackle and it's a touchdown. It was a good overall play, but you do, you have to be able to make the tackle. I mean, that's just, you have to be able to finish if you're going to be really successful in the NFL. And that is something that would worry me a little bit. Granted, also should be mentioned, neither one of those plays, he had particularly great placement. You know, those are both kind of tough tackles where he kind of had to make arm tackles, but he wasn't able to make those. However, you know, it's kind of like that Jerry Rice quote I always say, where if you can touch the ball, you can catch the ball. Well, I kind of feel like if you're a defensive lineman, if you can touch the player with the ball, you can tackle the player with the ball. You have to have that mindset, and LJ was not able to make the tackle on that one. One other thing that I feel like bothers me a little bit is I do feel like he could use a little bit more quickness. Like on this play, he's actually on the bottom half of the screen once again as an edge rusher, but he's not going to be running in like that he's going to fake as though he's running in but then run out to the top half of the screen that's the way this play is designed to work for him but notice how he kind of stells a little bit too long it takes a while to get back over to the top half of the screen granted this ball was thrown pretty quickly anyways so it didn't really matter too much however it still wasn't a great play from him Really what I didn't like about it is how long it took him to get his step over to the left side of the screen and then move over. Because at that point, it's already clear what you're doing. It's already clear that you're slinging over. You know, take that first step, but then quickly run around. And he ran way too far back and did not run a good good angle over there to try to get into the position where he could make a play. This is the nitpick. You know, I do try to look at all the negatives and the positives. I really don't feel like this is a huge negative at all. But it is something I noticed. And, you know, I bring up everything I notice, whether it's positive or negative. There was also this one where it's actually going to be a three-man rush here instead of a four-man rush. And one one thing worth noting is that while it appears as though the left tackle is going to be having a one-on-one -on -one block with Collier, it is also worth mentioning that, you know, the interior lineman is going to be in the nose in this situation. Since it's only a three-man rush, this now means that we don't know what the left guard is going to do. He could move over to the interior lineman or he could move over to the edge rusher. That has to be something in the back of number 91's head. And also, one thing you're going to see that left tackle do is kind of give up a step, essentially. He's going to take a step back and he's going to allow Collier to get close to him. I also feel like I've been probably watching too much hockey because I keep wanting to call him Coulier. I know that's not how it's pronounced, but that's just, that's just how I read it in my head. So from here at this point, you know, what should you do if you're LJ? You should continue running over to the right side of the screen, try to get around the tackle if possible, and at least try to flush that quarterback out. And also, you got to make sure you don't go up containment so you can't run too far to the inside. However, he's going to try to run to the inside anyways and basically just run straight into a double team and gets knocked out of the way. And in fairness, you know, there is also a risk of going around, as you saw on the other side of the screen, where that edge rusher went too far to the top half of the screen but then the tackle was able to push him over behind his quarterback so then the quarterback was able to scramble out of the pocket it was a no-win situation for number 91 anyways which is why I'm pretty against three-man rushes as a whole but I also do feel like you do have to try to get around someone if you are in a three-man rush that has to be the mindset you have to spread out the five offensive linemen as much as possible because if you do that you're at least giving someone a one-on-one -on -one matchup where they could potentially make a play total nitpick and that's not something you'll see him make a mistake on too often but again Something I noticed, so I'm bringing it up. And he also can be very effective at getting around a tackle, and this one will be an example of that. He's going up against the left tackle, and he's actually not going to have a particularly great first step here. He's slow in creating contact, but the second he does, he has the hand placement he wants. He kind of faked as though he could be going in either direction, and then when he finally did create contact, the left tackle was already pretty significantly far back. And not just that, but he can put his left arm right there on the tackle's right side of his body, and now he can basically just control his entire play. He's not the tallest edge rusher at only 6'2", but he's 200. 183 pounds, which is definitely good size. He also ran a 4.9140, which is pretty significant for a guy who's almost 300 pounds. Another thing I do actually like about him is his hands. You know, hands are very important as an edge rusher. Some could argue it's the most important thing as an edge rusher, and he definitely can do it effectively. Like as if here, once again, he is going one-on-one -on -one against the left tackle, and notice how, again, he does take his time in initiating this contact, but he's doing it for a reason. He's going to wait until he can get the hand placement he wants, because now he has the exact hand placement he wants. Most specifically, it's his right arm, which is on the right side of that tackle's left arm. Doing this, he'll be able to push that arm off to the side, and then watch how he's able to basically just twist and get past him. Now, at this point, if you're a left tackle, what can you do? Well, you're going to have to just try to push him behind the quarterback. That's your only hope at this point. And so how is that going to work? Well, actually, he's not even going to have to do that because LJ just falls down because he slipped on the grass. It's hard to blame him too much for that because it's not like it's something I saw him do consistently. It's probably just some bad patch of grass and it's an unfortunate break. But I actually like that play from him. I thought it was a pretty solid play. I thought he had some good hand placement there and that could have easily been a sack if it wasn't for the fact that he slipped. A slip's gonna happen, you know, it's unfortunate. But as a whole, I do think this guy is a talented player. Will he be Frank Clark level of talent? 
probably not. But now they don't have to pay Frank Clark and they have more draft picks. So I do think that as a whole, it could be a positive benefit for Seattle. Not to mention with the fact that they are now paying Russell Wilson a lot of money. They can't really afford to be paying a bunch of players a lot of money. They do have to kind of pick and choose who they pay. So I think it's a good player. I do think that his upside is double digit sacks. I do see that as a possibility from him. I think he has some things he has to clean up. That's probably why he went so late in the first round. I do think that he probably won't exactly burst onto the scenes next year, but I can see him in the next few years being a very solid contributor.